by one time, uh, they don't ever see you again, you know. Uh, and so it's just a, it's an absolute miracle that that I'm that I'm still here. Uh, when I tell my testimony to the Latins, especially the people from Central America and Mexico, they're just shocked and blown away because you know you don't get kidnapped by these people once and live. I mean, these people, uh, the most reputed drug lords in the world, the, they were formed by the U.S. CIA, trained by the U.S. Rangers at Fort Benning, and, and they, they became the most reputed drug lords in the world. They worship Satan. They eat people. You know, these are, these are not good people, <laughs> you know. And so to have been kidnapped five times by this group, and I won't say which one, uh, is an absolute miracle, you know. Um, uh, well, the first time I got kidnapped down there was by an old 86-year-old man who... who uh, who in Monterrey, Monterrey, um, Monterrey Nuevo León, right? It's the second largest city in Mexico. And this old guy comes into my into the bar, and I just sat down to drinking a beer, and I played the American music. And this guy comes over, and he's like, got this little guitar with three, three strings on it, no sandals, so he's he's muy pobre, he's very poor. And he's like, comes over, and he's like, ding, 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 ding. he's playing the guitar for me, and I'm like, look, man. I will pay you not to play that guitar, and I'll buy you a Kawama. So I get 35 pesos, and then I buy a 35 peso Kawama. It's like a 40-ounce beer. And, and so my guard was down because he's like 86 years old. I didn't think anything of it. And so I wake up in, in the next day in, in this cell two stories up, and, and, he's, and he's got my phone on the other side of this prison bar door with these big chains on these concrete pillars, and, 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 and he's just out of reach. I couldn't reach him. My head was pounding. I'd been drugged. And, and so I went over to the bars on the window, and God gave me the strength to bend these bars. And, and, and I, I crawled through, and I hung from the bars, and I swung to this little wooden porch thing that miraculously held me. And I ran around, and, and I was going to not be this guy's friend. I was very angry. And, and all the other doors in the whole apartment building or hotel uh, had, were half doors, half wooden, no bottom, no top, and just wooden, except for mine. Mine had prison doors on it. And, and so it was a, this guy was a, a, what we call a sequestrador. You know, he was a kidnapper. And because down there you can sell people. Like you get somebody that doesn't smoke or drink or something, you can sell their body parts. You can kidnap them and you can sell them. Um, and, and so this is what they normally do. They'll, they'll have you uh, call your family and get money, and then they'll kill you. Matter of fact, they, they take everybody off the trains. Whenever you ride the cargo trains down there, they, you have to have somebody on top of the train watching because they'll have little kids pick up a rope across the long street stretch, and then they, the conductor doesn't want to hit the rope because it's going to hurt the kids, so he'll stop because he knows that the people that jump out of the jungle armed with masks on aren't going to kill the people in the conductor in the engine because they have federales in there and guns, and so they just they take everybody off the train and they slaughter everybody. And these are against company rules. So by me telling you this, I'm not I'm not the company. They're not allowed to do that. These are rogue sections of the company, and they're not supposed to do it. So it's okay if I tell you about that. Um, but so, I mean, they, God had just delivered me so many times, so many times. Just, I mean, I could go on for hours about the, uh, how many times he's delivered me. But um, so it's, it's a very dangerous way. They even say, aquí es tres mundos. You know, here is third world. And, and so you got to be real careful. You know, the first time I got kidnapped, I said, i got to learn this language. Un palabra diario, one word a day. And, and once you can say refrigerator in Spanish, you can say anything in Spanish. <laughs> Refrigerador. <laughs> you know, and so I used to watch movies and I'd, and I'd learn how to, I'd hear it in English and then read it in Spanish. Because once you learn the alphabet, exactly how they spell it is how they say it. So once you learn the alphabet, you can read Spanish. And, and so it's not like English. And so um, God is a delivering God. Um, Years later, so let me go back to the, the Colbert family. I know I'm jumping all over on you guys. Sorry about that. Um, I just got to be careful what I say because this is going on YouTube and, and I, I don't want, uh, I've been told by certain agencies that I got to be careful what I say. So, and it's just prudent to be careful what I say. Usted sabe, ¿no? Escuchen ver y You know, the mafia down there, they have different sayings, you know, like, uh, they'll say, ¿Sabes por qué Dios regalo usted dos orejas, dos ojos y solo una boca para escuchar ver y cállese? It's a mafia saying. They say, do you know why God gave you two ears, two eyes, and only one mouth? To listen, watch, and shut up. <laughs> you know, um, one time I went to what's called a Puerta Negra uh, uh, in Monterrey. 
I, I was an alcoholic back then and I needed alcohol because I, my mind was so bombarded with just bleh that I, I, I needed any relief from, from the oppression of the enemy. And so I would drink. And, and, one, and down there in certain cities and states, you can't buy alcohol on Sunday unless you go to the company. And so this taxi driver drives me all over, spends, it cost me like 200 something pesos, which is a lot of money down there, for this taxi ride. He keeps taking me to bars that are closed. I'm like, look, man, I know you know of one that's open. You better take me there, right? And I was angry. So he ends up taking me to what's called a Puerta Negra. And I didn't even know the, where I was going. But it's in a nice neighborhood, and, and you got police checkpoints to even get into the neighborhood. And, and, and so when you go there, there's no Carta Blanca, no Pacifico on the outside of the building. It just looks like a rich person's house. But on the inside, it's all soundproofed. And, and you open the door, and boom, they got live music in there, famous people, famous football players. They got you know, generals. They got com comorantes, the, the SWAT of DFA. I mean, they got all kinds of heavy hitters in there. And I didn't know where I was at. I was ignorant. I'm in there arm wrestling bodyguards for beers and, and just being a, not too smart, you know. And... Uh, I was talking to the commander of SWAT and DFA to get a job because I told him I'll, I'll train you in weapons, arms, tacticals, militares, armas, bombas, everything. And so, so he takes, they take me in uh, the outside. The commander takes me outside and he gives me his card, which is what I really wanted was that card because if I got pulled over, I could say, "Hey, call my buddy," and then they they leave me alone. Because we say down there, "Nos conosos es quien conosos." It's not what you know, but who you know. And so. I wanted this card, and when I came back in, my Kawama was gone, and I was angry because I had more money. I spent it all on the taxi, so I'm like, well, "Where's my beer? Where's my beer?" You know. And so, of course, they gave me another beer. They got approval to to kill me, so they gave me a beer that's got strychnine in it, and I, I didn't I didn't know it at the time. But the next day, I was vomiting up this cottage cheese looking stuff, and it's like choking on its way out. This medical doctor told me he said that's that was your stomach lining. He said that was strychnine poisoning. And so these, these are professionals, right? They don't accidentally, whoops, didn't give you enough strychnine. No, they know how much to give you. I mean, in fact, if I'm hired to kill somebody and that person doesn't die, then I die. So these, these, these guys aren't going to make a mistake and whoops, we didn't give you enough. No, they gave me enough. I mean, I, I must have passed like a half a bucket of diarrhea. I was like getting stabbed in the stomach every 15 seconds. It was just brutal, very painful. You know, yeah. See it, didn't it? <laughs> yeah. And, and so... Um, and, and, you know, before I was always afraid to talk about this stuff to, to people. I, I would Sometimes I would brag about it. But now I, I know that, that God is sovereign and that, that he, will, he, will, he will protect. I know that, that, that as much as he's brought me through. I'm, uh, and I want to present this stuff in a way that honors God and points your attention to, to what God has done in my life. Not that I'm anything, because I'm not. What God has done for any of his children, he'll do for all of his children. The difference doesn't lie with him. He cannot change. He's immutable. The difference lies with us and, and, and essentially our response to God's discipline. When God disciplines us in life, I was just talking to somebody this morning about Jacob. I loved Esau. I hated. So how did, the, how did God's love towards Jacob manifest itself? Well, Jacob didn't come into the promised land except for till he was limping when he came in. Right? Now Esau, God had promised Abraham that he would bless Esau and he did. But he essentially, like Paul Washer says, he kind of cut the rope and just let Esau be Esau and didn't discipline him. There's no, record, there's no record of God disciplining Esau in Scripture. But there is record of God disciplining Jacob. So we see that in life, when God disciplines us, this is evidence of his love for us. You know, I've spent most of my life locked up in four countries. Three of them third world, two of them in civil war. And, and I'm not bragging about that. I'm just, it's just a simple fact. You know, um, and, and, I, and I, would, I would get out, uh, I wouldn't spend much time out, and then I'd be right back locked up. And God was disciplining me and only allowing me to go so far into sin. And, and so I must have been locked up. I think one cop told me, she goes, do you know how many states you've been locked up in this country? I said, uh, I think 28. And she said, no, 36. So 36 states in this country, 29 states in Mexico, every state in Guatemala, and every state in Honduras. And so... God has, has been disciplining me and, and through life, trying to get my attention, you know. Um, and so when we respond correctly to his discipline, uh, we, that makes us plappable. In other words, God is able to mold a person into the man of God or woman of God that he wants to make them. And this is why he disciplines us in life. Um, God deals with individuals as he does nations. 
he, and, and he will discipline nations as well. And so, um, and he does this out of his love for us. God is a unitary being, meaning when we say God is one, it not only means that monotheism, meaning one God, but it also means that he is one in his essence. It, God doesn't, isn't a composite of different attributes. Uh, in other words, things that we can attribute to God, like his faithfulness, goodness, justice, mercy, grace, love, holiness, sovereignty. These are things that we know are true of God, but it, it's not like they, they're not a composite making up his being. No, he is unitary in his being, meaning he is not 